morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, it's a good crowd here. It's good to see everyone. Uh, if you're visiting, we'd like to thank you for visiting. And uh, just please fill out a visitor card or stop by and see one of us before you leave. Uh, we, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, if, you're, if you need communion supplies, just raise your hand. We've got it in the back. But we'll, we'll help you get that as well. Um, and if you visit on Facebook, thank you for joining in, in for that uh, platform as well. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, there's a family get-together at Mark and Tories. Uh, this is uh, at the Price's home in Carthage, March 19th, starting around 3 p.m. Uh, that's after the church cleanup on a Saturday. And just let Tory know if you need the address and bring a dish to share with everyone. So I'll post this. Again, that's March 19th, around 3 p.m. at Tory and Mark's. Uh, today is Harry's 86th birthday, so we'd like to uh, wish him, please wish him a happy birthday. And it's good to see him and Mary here today as well. Uh, a few upcoming events, March the 4th, uh, Lisa's having a godly gals meeting at her house. That'll be at 6 p.m. Again, that's March the 4th. March the 5th, Ladies' Day at Church of Christ in Cary. Uh, the March the 19th, Again, on a Saturday, we'll have a church uh, men's cleanup. Uh, we'll have a cleanup at the church after our men's meeting. That's March 19th. And then April 3rd through 6th, we're having our gospel meeting where Paul, uh, Paul Mays will be speaking. And there's more info to come on that one. Uh, if you have any information you'd like to share in the bulletin, please see Doug or Florence, and their contact information is in the bulletin. And prayer request, uh, please continue to keep Sandra Stevens in our prayers. She still has some uh, health concerns. Uh, it's good to see uh, Gary and Connie here today. Uh, keep the Voss family, uh, Billy and the, uh, his son, uh, in our prayers. Um, and we could, <clears throat> we will continue uh, to keep uh, Yolanda's father, Freddie Hicks, who's going through uh, pancreas. Uh, he's going through prost. Um, Chemo for for cancer, and his wife Regina. So she's a caretaker. So keep those in our prayers as well. Uh, one other will be uh, continue with uh, Jonathan, who is Van's nephew, and his wife Bridget, and their new baby, uh, who was born and uh, had surgery a few weeks ago. So keep that family in our prayers. In addition to some who are traveling today as well. Uh, I think that's all the announcements. Uh, if you will, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the day you've given us, and, and Lord, just for giving us the, the air we breathe and the, the beautiful day today. Even though it's raining, it's a beautiful day, a beautiful day to be here and worship you. Lord, thank you for uh, forgiving us for our sins, and thank you for sending your son Christ to, uh, to die on the cross for us. And dear God, as we uh, begin our worship in a few minutes, we lift up prayers for those who are listed uh, we lift up celebrations for, for Harry and his 86th birthday, and we lift up all those who are traveling. <clears throat> Lord, as we uh, begin our worship, we pray that everything we do is a matter pleasing to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few years ago, Harry, you were in your seventies. I, I can remember. <laughs> Congratulations. One ninety nine. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven. What I can see when my Lord's living in me, you know that Jesus is there and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would fall. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime. All works of the master I live for. Jesus is well. 
He makes His home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since He promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the deep around me all made. Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. And Lord will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. 429. 429. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we carry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds as they sing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we carry there None other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go Through the voice of one His voice to me is calling And he walks with me And he talks with me And he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known If you'll turn with me to 603 We'll sing number 603 before the Lord's Supper It sure is good to have uh, Gary with us this morning. Have him back. I understand he's feeling uh, quite a bit better and, and Duke has discovered what his problem is and, and they've taken care of it. So it's uh, good to have Gary with us. <clears throat> 603. I am mine no more. I am mine no I've been bought with blood, I am mine no more. Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Lord, and He 
he ruled my life. Jesus is my Lord. He will come again. He will come again. And he'll take me home, he will come again. I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I've been born with blood. I am mine no more. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's try to remember how Jesus willingly went to the cross without any hesitation or secret evasion of mind or he just did as God asked him to. Let's go to God in prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, how great and mighty you are, God. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son for our salvation, Father. We ask all these things through his name, Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. Father God, we once again come to you praising your name, Father, and praising your Son, Father, for his sacrifice, Lord, and the blood that was spilt on the cross for our lives and our souls. We ask all these things through Jesus. Amen. That concludes our Lord's Supper. Now we have a chance to give back to God a portion that He's given to us. And there's a collection box over here on the left-hand side as you walk out of the auditorium here. If you want to give, please do so. Let's go to God in prayer one more time. Father God, we thank You for all of our many material blessings, Father. And we know that all good things come from You, God. And Father, we hope that we'll use the monies that we receive in a manner that's pleasing to you according to your sight. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'll be reading verses 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor 
and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Good morning. Good to see you this morning as we have joined in worship. I'm so glad that you've made the effort to be here. So good to see Gary and Connie here. Uh, I know they have uh, not enjoyed being away from us, but I'm glad to see them. I pray that things will continue to go in a good direction there. Uh, Good to see all of you for our visitors. I want to let you know how uh, thankful we are that you are here and uh, and have made the desire to be a part of this time. Um, uh, I want to begin by looking at a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In our Wednesday night classes, we've been looking at the kings of Israel. Uh, we have been discussing um, their... Um, their, their desire to have a king and what ha- happened as a result of that. Now, uh, I'm going to skip this image. I'll be back to it in just a minute. But you, you may remember that bef- before 1 Samuel 8, and even during this time, Israel had been led by judges. Now, the last of those judges will be Samuel himself. And God has worked through these judges to lead the people. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people have begun to look around them and have noticed something about themselves that they're a little different than everybody else. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and you begin there in verse 4, uh, you notice the text says that the elders of Israel had gathered together. A lot of... Uh, some things can happen when people get together, right? And they get to talking with one another. And maybe they got together talking about how they're different, unlike these other nations. Well, they bring uh, Samuel to them, and they say, you are old. (laughs) Now, that's not such a kind way to start a conversation, is it? (laughs) Buddy, you're old. But uh, they know Samuel is aging and... And they remember what happened with Eli. Now, if you go back in your mind, you remember Eli um, was not the best judge. And he had two children that were really bad. And they did a lot of damage in, in Israel. And so they say to Samuel, you're old and your sons do not follow your ways. And so here is Samuel, the judge of Israel, and maybe they believe, well, here's history repeating itself again. Uh, we need to change things up. And, and so they, they ask or they request to, to appoint a king to lead us. And notice the end of this where they say, such as all other nations have. What was their desire was to be like everybody else. Now, God had created a very distinctive people in the Israelites. He had um, brought them out of slavery in Egypt and had refined them in the wanderings, had delivered them into the promised land and given them everything He promised them. And now, and, and, and had appointed judges to handle their disputes and to lead them into battle. And now this, this people that, that you had put so much effort and time into to make distinctive, to make unique, to make your own, are now begging for a king so that they can what? Be like everybody else. They can be like all the other nations. And so they, they begin to beg for a king and, and, and Samuel's displeased by this. As you... And I probably would too, right? And so he goes to God, and in verse 7, um, God tells Samuel, he says, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say uh, to you, for they have not rejected you. Now, I'm sure Samuel felt rejected, but God says that's not what they're doing. 
They are what? They have rejected me. Uh, he says, obey the voice of the people and all they say to you. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And so they don't want to be distinctive anymore. They don't want to be unique in their relationship with God. They just want to be like everybody else. And you can almost hear the dismay that God is, is, is putting forth here that, that here are these people that he loved that are rejecting him, that are putting him to the side for something else so that they can be like the rest of the world. They didn't want to be God's people alone. They wanted to be people of the world. And as time carries on, they have their kings, and just like God promised them, their kings lead them in, um, you know, into uh, sin and into destruction of their relationship with God. You go and you study the rest of the king's history, and then you get to the time of the captivity. First, it's uh, the Assyrians that come in and take the northern kingdom of Israel. Later on, it's Babylon that will come in and take captive the southern kingdom of Judah. During the midst of this, you have the prophets arising and the prophets beginning to speak to the people about repentance and about coming back to God, about leaving sin and idolatry and, and, and following God alone. Jeremiah is one of those prophets who uh, had a long career of, of, going, of being a prophet of God. And in one of his prophecies in Jeremiah 31, as he speaks to the people, he looks forward to a day in the future. Now, ever since man had been kicked out of the garden, God's greatest desire is to restore that relationship with, with his people, with the faithful he wants that, 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 that relationship of Eden restored. And he had somewhat of that relationship with the people of Israel, but they had rejected him. And so in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah points to a future day when God will have that which he desires. He says, Behold, the, uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the and with uh, I'm sorry and with and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. You, know, you almost it's echoes of of First Samuel eight seven right. They've not rejected you, they've rejected me. He says, though I was their husband, though we had this relationship, what happened? Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Talking about the intimacy, the, the close connection between God and his people and the way they loved him and the way he'll love them. And then he makes this statement. He says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Not like the people of the world, not like the, the, the world lives it's going to be my distinctive people. They're going to be mine. You know, when you think about this idea of distinctiveness, uh, I'm going to back up here for just a second. Sometimes on the fly you decide to reorder your slides. You ever heard the term the real McCoy? I did. I heard it growing up. Now, when we talk about something being the real McCoy, we're talking about something being genuine, something being real, the real thing. Um, there was a man, Elijah McCoy. Now, there's a little bit of debate about where that phrase arose from. One of the thoughts that that, that, that phrase, the real McCoy, came from this guy named Elijah McCoy. Uh, he was a Canadian born free in Canada who later with his family after the time that slavery had ended had come down into America and become U.S. citizens. 
And as McCoy grew up, he was a very intelligent man. And you know, during that time period, the 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 locomotive was the was the carrier of the day. It it carried people across the country. It carried freight across the country. Railroads were were vital to U.S. growth. Right? And, and what McCoy did in working with the railroad and, and, and learning about uh, locomotives and how they worked, he developed the original oil filter. Now that's what you see there on on I guess your left. There is 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 the patent for his original design. Now, if you're a gearhead or you understand anything about cars, you understand the importance of having a good quality oil filter. All right? Don't go out there and get that cheap brand. You need a good oil filter. You want your engine to last a little while. Go ahead and pay a little extra. Well, he was the guy that designed this. And so he started putting this as a way to, to clean the lubricants in the engines and those locomotives. Lubricant's important. Those pistons aren't going to pump as well if you don't have good, clean lubricant. And so he, he began to develop these. Well, what happens anytime you have somebody bring something on the market? You have generics. You have generics come up. You know, generics in medicine is really vital because generics are so much cheaper than the real thing, right? Well, we have generics of everything. The generics sometimes, though, like you take a, a Dr. Pepper. Now, the generic of a Dr. Pepper is a Mr. Pib or Dr. Thunder. Now, you may really like those, but they're not quite Dr. Pepper, right? You have the generic Cokes, right? Uh, Mountain Lightning is not the same thing as Mountain Dew, right? They're not quite the same thing. And you had all these generics come on the market, and they, they didn't do as well as McCoy's did. And so you had these engineering companies coming and saying, I want the real McCoy. I want the original. I want the, the, the unique design of Elijah McCoy. I don't want these other designs. His design was distinctive in nature. And it made a difference. You think about the church and the people of God. God has called us to be distinctive. Peter says to us that he's called us to be his royal priesthood, his particular people. There is a distinctive nature about the follower of God about the church. And so I want to spend a little time, we won't finish everything this week, I want to begin a series of lessons looking at the distinctive nature of the church that was established by Jesus Christ. What is the biblical distinctiveness of the nature of the kingdom of God? Now, we walk down our streets in all of our cities across this country and in our rural areas, and what do we see? Thousands of church buildings with all kinds of different uh, names out front, with all kinds of different forms of worship and organization within the building, within the people. And I'm sure that living in, in this time period and looking out there and seeing all of that, if you don't uh, know a whole lot about the church or the Bible, it can be confusing, and it can be overwhelming. And you may ask yourself, why is all of this going on? You know, in our country, this was a few years ago, but um, we have like some 400 different denominational groups. If you look at them, um, you know, not, not examining down into the different uh, schisms within each group. Right, if you just look at the major Christian denominations in our country, there are all these, um, all of these different groups, right? All doing different things. And even within those 400, there's something like 20,000 underneath that of, of very particular denominations. 
like in, in the Baptist church. You don't just have the Baptist church and that be a big broad label. You've got the Southern Baptist, the Free Will Baptist, and on and on. And I'm not trying to pick on any one group, but, but you notice all that, and what does it sound like? Chaos. Well, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 14, that God is not the author of chaos, but of peace and order. And so, when we talk about the church, I think it's important to understand its nature. And is what we see in the world what God wants it to be? Am I what God wants me to be? Am I a part of that distinctive church of the New Testament? And so I want to cover these ideas um, this morning and, and in the future weeks. But when we talk about the distinctive nature of the church, I think, number one, it's distinctive in its origin. It's distinctive in its origin. There's an important passage that, that, that I want us to consider, and we'll spend a little time here over the weeks. But in Matthew 16, Matthew 16 is unique in that it's the very first time that Jesus ever uses the term church in the New Testament. That's the first time. And that, that's a fascinating idea. Now, he spoke about the kingdom of God prior, but it's the first time that, that he uses that term. In verse 17, he says, I will build my church. Now, in the Greek, that term church there is the term, the Greek term, Ecclesia. Now it's made of two, two Greek terms. It's a compound word, ek and klesia, which ek is out, and, um, and the, when you put it together, it's the called out. Right? And, and ecclesia could be used in the first century in a very generic way. Now we think church, we have a very distinct impression in our minds. I bet most of us, if I say the word church to you, the first thing that pops into your mind is maybe a building or, or the concept of a Christian group, right? But when, when that term was used in the first century, ecclesia was not, um, was more of a generic idea behind it. It was just simply referring to a gathering. What makes church distinctive in the New Testament and in our modern time is the connotation or the meaning that Jesus gives to it. That's what makes it unique. That's what makes it unique in this passage in Matthew 16. After Peter makes his good confession in verse 15, or verse 16, Jesus said in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Jesus says, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I said, Peter makes that confession of faith, and then Jesus goes on in verse 17 to say, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of John, or Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. All right? So that's how he begins it. He, he, he's saying to Peter that this knowledge of me, me being the Messiah, the anointed one of God, is not an earthly thing. You've received this from God. This is a God dictate to the earth. I am the Son of God. Jesus referring there to himself. He says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, or who is in heaven. Verse 18, And I tell you, based upon the, the concept that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, I will what? On this rock, on that, con uh, on that confession that, that Jesus is the living uh, Son of God, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my particular called out. I think it's interesting in Acts 22 and verse 16 as Paul is recounting his conversion to Christ. And in verse 16, Ananias says to Saul at the time, Paul later, he says, so, um, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou, that's the old King James, why tarriest thou, arise and wash away your sin, noticing this, calling on the name of the Lord. Right? He tells us in there how we call on God and how God calls us out of the world. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, we'll have this up here in a few minutes, but 
Colossians 1 and verse 13, Paul writing to the Colossian brethren talks about how they had been called out of the world, out of the uh, the dominion of sin and darkness, and it been transferred or moved into the kingdom of God's beloved Son, His dear Son. All right, and so this idea of being called out—that's what we are. If you're a Christian, if you've obeyed the gospel, you've been called out of the world and placed into the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, I will build my church. Now, it's interesting, a little bit later in that same text, if you go down to verse 28, Jesus uh, talking uh, he, um, a little later, he says to those who were living that day, listening to him in that moment, he says, um, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. There were some living in that moment who would see the establishment of the church. Now you notice he says kingdom there, but if you back up, you notice that he uses the word kingdom and church interchangeably. They were meaning the same thing. He talks about the kingdom, His kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, He's talking about the church. And he, he says to them, there will be some who are standing, listening to him that very day who would see the establishment of the church. You go later on in the book of Matthew to chapter 26, and there they are, uh, it's Jesus and his apostles, and they're, they're, they're partaking of the Passover. And... At the end of that night, as they're getting ready to close things up, Jesus then takes the, takes the bread, he divides it and passes it. He, he then proclaims that that's his body. And then he takes the cup, he then hands the cup out. He says, partake of this, this is, the, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Right? So he institutes what we did this morning in, in, in the uh, Lord's Supper. And I want you to notice verse 29 in particular. In doing that, he says about the Lord's Supper, he says, I tell you I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What's going to happen in the next little bit here? In the next 24 hours, Jesus is going to be on a cross on a hill called Mount Calvary. He's going to be up there for like uh, six hours, and then he's going to die and be uh, buried in the tomb, and he's going to resurrect on Sunday morning. And so he says here, I will not drink it again with you until I drink it again. When? In my Father's kingdom. Again, what's Jesus pointing to by that statement? The kingdom's establishment is going to take place very shortly. Now you go later in the book of Matthew 28. In, uh, in Matthew 16, he told the apostles, he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. All right? It's the apostles that are going to be given the information to, uh, to teach to others about how to become a part of this call to group, how, how to enter into the gates of the kingdom. Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, Jesus initiates and commissions the apostles to do that very thing. In verse 19, he says, Go therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the fulfillment of Matthew 16 when he says, I'm going to give you the keys. Well, in Matthew 28, he gives them the keys, right? And he says, I want you to go. He commissions them with their task. Well, in the book of Acts, right away we see they begin that process. In Acts chapter 1, 
Jesus, of course, for about 40 days is with the apostles after his resurrection. The end of Luke and at uh, the beginning of Acts, we have recorded the ascension of Christ into heaven. Now at that point, when Jesus ascends into heaven, he'll never again ever put foot on the soil of this earth. He's ascended to heaven. The next time he comes, he'll come in the clouds and he'll call his up to him. And so in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, he presented himself alive. So Luke is, is summarizing very quickly that period of 40 days. Now there's a lot more written about that. You can go back and look at the, um, at the gospel accounts and you can see there's a lot of detail that, that the book of Acts is trying to summarize real quickly. But it says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days. Speaking what? About the kingdom of God. What was he speaking to them about? What was his final commission about? The kingdom of God. What's right after this, Jesus tells them to wait for about 10 days they're in Jerusalem. They're, they're hanging out. They've got this place. We just know it as the upper room, but it, it's this establishment where they're staying. And they're waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. It comes in Acts chapter 2 after they filled Judas' office with Matthias. And you've got now 12 again, uh, 12 apostles again. They're in that upper room. The Holy Spirit comes in there and He appears above their heads as tongues of fire. And then what do they do? They begin to speak in other languages. And they stand up and you can go read the second chapter of Acts and you can see how they preach the very first gospel sermon. And in verse 37, the people who are hearing this, about 3,000 of them are cut to the heart, the text tells us. And they respond, men and brethren, what... What should we do or what must we do? Peter says in verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to all those whom God will what? Call from afar off. Again, that called out. The text goes on to tell us that that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 39, for the promise is for you and for your children, for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 40, about 3,000, sorry, they continue preaching. Verse 41, about 3,000 people are added to them. Thus, you have the establishment of the New Testament church. Verse 47 says, They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added, God called, what, those who were being saved. He added to them those who were being saved. And, and so this idea, this concept that, that the church is unique in its origin. Now you go out and you begin researching all these different denominations. All these other churches that have the name Christ on them or, or relate some t in some way to Christianity, what you'll find is their origins don't look like this. Their origins come from some other place. The origin of the New Testament church finds its establishments, its beginnings, its foundations in the book of Acts, in the first century in the words we have in our Holy Scripture. The church that Christ founded was founded that day, not years later or even centuries later. That is distinct. That makes the church distinctive in its origin. The church is also distinctive in its name and its mission. Um, again, you go drive around and you see all kinds of different uh, names uh, given to different groups. And it creates all this confusion and understanding who we are, what we're a part of. Well, the Bible is clear 
in that who the church belongs to and the name it ought to wear, the name it does wear. Again, in Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will build my church. If the church had a deed on it or had a deed created, whose name would be on the deed? It had Jesus Christ. You have a deed made up for your house. There's one. If you own a home, you have a deed. And it's stored away in some kind of filing system somewhere. But it has your name on it. And if it doesn't, you might need to check that out. Because the deed has the name of the owner. Is that what we see? Is that what we see when we look around? I don't think so. And again, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, when, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, reminding them about their former life, the thing they laid behind, he says that God has delivered us from the dominion of, of darkness, the domain of darkness, and has transferred us. Can we think of the idea of he's called us, he's brought us, he's moved us, he's allowed us to enter to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. We've been called out of the domain of darkness and have been translated or transferred into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In Romans 16 and 16, Paul says, in identifying the church, says, um, says to those brethren in Rome, Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. All right? They, uh, churches of whom? What's the of? That's, that's the important part, right? Of Christ. They belong to Him. That's who we are. When we talk about churches of Christ, we're not talking about it, or I'm not, from a denominational sense. The church is not a denomination. It's not to be divided up. There is one church. And so when we talk about this, I don't want to think about this as though it's some kind of uh, a domination among denominations. There's this effort among some in the church who, who are trying to look at the church as just one among many. That's not true. That's not the way it should be. Maybe that's the way some people see it. Well, we need to check what we understand against what the Word of God teaches. There's one church. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, uh, in explaining this to the brethren of the first century, says to them that, that in verse 3 of Ephesians 4, we ought to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. The unity of the Spirit where? The church amongst one another. That's his point. If you go back to Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse 15 and following, he says he wanted to create in himself one new man that, verse 16, might reset, uh, re reconcile us both to God in one body. One body. One church. There aren't all these broken up Churches, that's not that's that's just simply not true. And if you see yourself as a member of a denomination, let me ask you, are you living biblically? Are you viewing things from a biblical standpoint? I am not a member of any denomination. I'm a member of the one true church of God. Back in Ephesians chapter four, after saying we ought to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. Verse 4, it says, there is one body. Now, Ephesians chapter 1, as he began the letter, and he's setting forth this premise of he's talking about the unity of the church. That's, that's one of the main drives of the Ephesian letter. He says in Ephesians 1 and verse 22 that Christ has been given all power, authority in the church. Verse 22, he put all things under his feet, Christ's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. The church has one head, not all these different heads. It's one head, Jesus Christ. And then you notice, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
The church is one body of believers. And all these, there's not all these schisms. And if there are schisms that exist, they are man-made. And I don't want to be a part of anything man-made when it comes to my spiritual well-being. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul, in really nailing down this idea of the unity of the Spirit in regard to the church, he says to those brethren who had divided themselves up into schisms, you go and read the context, chapters 1 through 3, Paul again and again puts forward the idea that you cannot divide yourselves up, which they were doing. Some were calling themselves disciples of Christ. Some were calling them disciples of Paul. Some were calling them disciples of Peter. And some were calling themselves disciples of Apollos. And they wasn't right. And so he says in verses, uh, verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you... Uh, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. That's not what we see in the world around us. They're not united in mind and judgment. They're not united as one. They're segmented, division, uh, divisions of glory, right? The church is one. The distinctive church of the New Testament is one. And so when we talk about the church of Christ, we're not talking about some uh, de denomination among many denominations. We're talking about the church, the ecclesia, the called out of Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of that church. That church was established in the New Testament. And that's the only one I want to give my allegiance to. And I want to adhere to that distinctive uh, plan of God. When you think about the church and the necessity of being a part of that church. We're going to continue on in the coming weeks looking at the distinctive nature of the church in other areas. But if one thing I can impart to you, that I can encourage you, exhort you, is in this. Are you a member of that one church? If you're not a member of that one church, that one group of called out, the ecclesia that belongs to God, then you are in grave danger. You stand divided off from God. You stand divided off from His salvation, from His forgiveness. If you're not a member of that church, why would you continue to stay in that position you're in? This morning, if you're ready and you understand what it means to obey the gospel, we would love to help you in, in being obedient to that plan of salvation, that way of escape from sin and death. If you're ready to repent of your sins, to call on the name of Jesus, to... to um, to repent and to confess his name and to be baptized into Christ, you too can be added, just like they were in Acts chapter 2. You can be added to that group of believers and know that your name is secure and securely written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you a member of the church who's fallen away? Maybe sin has invaded your heart, your mind. Maybe there's a place for repentance in your life. We encourage you, exhort you, if you need to repent, don't put it off. If we can help in any way, please come as together we stand and as we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, 
watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling on sinner, come on. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercy? Mercy for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling us sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly tenderly Jesus is calling, calling us sinner, come home. Please be seated and turn to 615, 615, 615. <clears throat> To Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled, and born aloft to his secure the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go. Conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true. To Christ be loyal and be true. He needs brave volunteers to stand against the powers of sin. Move not thy friends or fears. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you and help you all your conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true. Christ be loyal and be true, and he will be your friend, defending and protecting you to life triumphant end. To Christ the Lord. 
Lord be true, for he will go with you and help you all your conflicts through. The Lord be true. 638. Number 638. Six thirty-eight. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred mind is like to that. Before our Father's throne, we pour our open prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other for the sympathizing tear. When we asunder part, it gives us Let's see, on the, uh, the 12th, March the 12th, is when we're going to Rock Hill for the men's fellowship. Uh, we uh, are going to get a uh, van, and we will leave here on that uh, Saturday morning, and uh, we'll be back in the 6 o'clock range that evening. But that uh, uh, is, a, is a good day with uh, speakers and uh, we always look forward to that. Also, uh, uh, good good singing. So uh, please uh, keep that date. And we, we, if you've not been before, we'd love to love to have you go with us because we really have a have a good day. Uh, also, we need to uh, remember the fellow Christians over in the Ukraine. Uh, I, I know. There are uh, some churches that have been planted over there, and uh, you know I'm, I'm sure y'all been seeing some of the articles and that type of thing. But we we certainly need to keep our fellow Christians in our prayers. Uh, if you'll stand, I'll uh, I'll close this in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the good health we enjoy today. We thank you for uh, the, the life that you've given each of us. We're thankful that we could come together with uh, fellow Christians and, and study uh, further from your word, Father, and sing songs of praise and offer prayers to you this morning. We're, we're thankful that we live in a country that we can worship you. Um, Father, uh, we do uh, pray for what's going over, going on over in, in uh, the Ukraine, and, and we know that there's uh, saints over there, Father. We pray that you'll uh, be with them and, and help them uh, get through uh, this time, this, this hard time. 
Father, uh, also we, we pray for the leaders of, of all the countries that are involved. And Father, we just would pray that, that they would look to you for answers and uh, uh, move, move out of this uh, situation and move towards peace. Uh, Father, we're uh, thankful to have uh, Gary uh, back with us. Gary and Connie we know that uh, Gary's uh, had uh, problems with his transplant, but uh, we're we're glad that uh, he's feeling better. And Father, pray that he'll continue in a, a good direction. We pray for uh, Billy Voss and pray for uh, Bill Bennett. And, and their families is uh, they can, they can't be with us this day, Father. We celebrate uh, Harry's uh, birthday. Uh, we're thankful for for Harry and and uh, the good uh, example he is to each each of us, Father. Uh, as we uh, leave here today, we pray that you will keep us safe. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.